the six foot tall. <laughs> Speak live. <laughs> Good morning. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Welcome, Fredericton, St. John, Bathurst, and Moncton, and maybe Grand Falls, and maybe the Mayor Machi. Uh, this morning, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Jack Youssef from Youssef Law Group. Jack's been around doing real estate law for 22 years. 22 years. Uh, he's uh, well well versed in, in the real estate side, uh, does a lot of transaction, and he is absolutely instrumental in when a realtor has a particular question that they don't mind calling you, he doesn't mind giving you the advice, and probably free of charge. <laughs> so without any further ado, let's introduce, uh, great pleasure to introduce Jack Youssef. Thank you. Woo! Thank you, Austin. Thank you guys. Good morning. I guess good morning to everybody. I'm really just used to talking to you guys in this room with a lot of familiar faces, but I guess I'm talking to a lot of people. So I should tell you a little bit about myself first. I have been doing exclusively real estate for almost 22 years and I've been actively educating in real estate for almost 20. Uh, this time of year, I always come around to all the real estate firms or make an offer and they always take me up on it to deal with the cobweb questions. The things that when you're coming up on a spring season, these are always the times that things get a little bit hectic. If it's slow over the winter and it starts to speed up and then I always find that it stays crazy right till the snow flies again. So it's really a matter of these are not things I'm teaching today that you shouldn't know, but these are things that maybe you can remind yourself of to keep yourself from the things I call things that you don't want to do to cut a check. So without further ado, we're going to touch on a couple of other things. I will be teaching at this year's AGM and I'll be teaching on the new condominium schedule clauses that you've all seen and started using, hopefully about six, seven months ago and about some of the trials and tribulations that uh, still exist with those today and the things that you should look out for as, as well. This morning is not about fear mongering, it's about teaching you to complete a transaction and walk away with your full commission check and have lots of time left over to work on the multitude of other files I'm sure you're working on. Congratulations to Keller Williams on expanding using some interesting technology because these lessons are province wide. Uh, although I don't direct, come into direct contact with a lot of people outside the area, it is true that I field a lot of phone calls in the run of the day and there never is a charge because honestly, anything that's better and educates an individual realtor or a group of realtors makes all ultimately my life easier. And we do do, a, uh, we do do, uh, we don't do do, we do do do, but not all the time. Um, we do a fair number of transactions, probably more than the average bear and it's due to a system that we use. My background is in uh, all the eologies, the psychology, sociology uh, and all of those because 90% of what we do, as you know, is more of being people that guide people through uh, transactions in the biggest one of their lives. So I've given you a couple of fun questions this morning. You don't have to hand them in. You don't have to write your name on them. 
I would like you to qu quickly read them if you haven't already. And you can either circle the answer that you think it is or just think about the answer because today's lesson is going to be about going through those questions and giving the practical solutions. I warn you, some of them are a little bit tricky, but they're not intended to be. Uh, but they're more or less to teach you about some of the intricacies. And the answer is always just call the lawyer, but just in case you're caught in the field, this is for you not to have to call the lawyer. And I think just because we're on video and we want to keep everything moving, I will read the questions uh, at today's lesson. I'll read the questions, I'll give you a, a few seconds to think about it, and then I'll provide you with the solution, and hopefully they will match. So the first question is, and these are called the cobweb questions, there are only 12. Real property in New Brunswick is assessed as of January 1st of each year with property taxes being charged from January 1st to December 31st. So is that true or false? Very true. That's a very easy one, right? It is true. Property taxes are assessed as of January 1st. And the reason why that's so important is because technically a property is assessed by the province and cut off on January 1st. The province does reserve the right to reassess a property at any time, but generally they don't because the, the whole theory behind it is you have an annual assessment, you get your bill in March, February, March, and you have to pay it before May 31st of each year. So obviously in those situations, uh, it's going to lead to some of the answers in the, in the further questions. But just know the taxes always run in the calendar year. The time that they get paid is what causes the confusion, and real estate uh, uh, property taxes are, is the, the single most misunderstood thing in New Brunswick real estate law. So although this stuff sounds easy, it is the thing that either creates a lot of misunderstandings with your clients or potentially have you cut a check if you gave the wrong advice to the client. Number two, if property being purchased is non-owner occupied, meaning that the person that's buying it doesn't live there or doesn't occupy all of it, and the purchaser intends to occupy a property as a principal residence, the property taxes will not be adjusted by the province until the following year if the closing is after May 31st. That's really true, isn't it? The answer is false. <laughs> property taxes can be reassessed by the province at any time, but generally speaking, if it's going from non-owner occupied to owner occupied, the province will always readjust if the person makes and is successful in the application. The good news is the lawyer makes that application and they do it digitally. So when I submit a transfer to the province, that yes, no qu question has to be answered. So we always, if the client applies and we have that discussion during a meeting, if they're gonna occupy 40% of it, it's based on the 40% that they're occupying plus 100% of the common area and so on. We do that calculation and we submit it off to the province and the province will, whenever they get around to it, complete that application. If it's approved, they backdate it to the date that they moved in or applied. If it's not approved, this is the, this is the tricky part, if it's not approved, it just disappears. So if we submit the application and the person didn't get approved for whatever reason, they're not actually a resident, they actually have another property, they haven't quite let go of it and so on, um, the tax bill may come to them and appear to them as the non-owner occupied rate. And if they lose their mind, it's okay. They can reapply at any time and they will backdate it to the date that they occupied the property or were approved. Isn't that good news? But the answer is false. Uh, if the property being purchased, number three, if the property being purchased is owner occupied, so now the person who owns it lives there, so it's getting the reduced rate of tax, and the purchaser does not intend to occupy the property as a principal residence, a renter, rental or a summer residence, the property taxes will not be adjusted by the province until the following year if the closing is after May 31st. I almost feel like I'm cheating by reading that one to you because I just gave you the answer kind of in the previous one. But still, think about that for just a second. The province always has the ability to reassess if they want, but they generally don't. Which means if your client is going from an owner-occupied to a non-owner-occupied, and no application is made by the lawyer because they're not making one, then generally, and more often than not, so not definitively, but more often than not, your non-owner-occupied purchaser will have the benefit of receiving that low tax rate for the remainder of the year. And it's because there's, a tr there's no triggering event. Whereas if it's not owner occupied, there's a triggering event being the application of the lawyer. When the person's going the other way, there is no triggering event and the province is obviously always very uh, ill-equipped due to staffing and so on and systems to be able to monitor and keep in real time all of those things. So it could happen, uh, but it's a potential windfall uh, and hopefully your clients will enjoy that, those when they come up. Sometimes they, it not only slips through the crack, but it stays through the cracks for many years. I, I, 
I hate to say this on video, but I still have a client that we still joke around about that has a vacant lot. Like uh, it's been almost 20 years, and it's still assessed at like, you know, forty-two thousand dollars. It's ignoring the four hundred and twenty thousand dollar house on the property. I, I'm not sure how it happened. I'm certainly not going to give the address or the client's name, but we chuckle about it every year. The province can deny an application for residential tax credit where the applicant does not have a provincial health card or driver's license showing the property as a principal residence. True or false? True. True. Yeah, because we've just learned that the province can pretty much do anything. If they decide to do it, it's up to you to prove that they can. So keep in mind that an application for residential tax credit can be refused for many reasons. But one thing that you want to be uh, to know about is what types of things they look for to determine whether a person is an actual resident to be able to qualify. Well, it, if they already live in the province, that's pretty straightforward. If they don't own any other property, uh, we always remind them, so you don't need to, to make sure you change your driver's license because the time they get to the application, if the province doesn't have them living there, obviously they can't tell the province they're living there. Um, also, more importantly, if they're coming from outside the province, you need to be extra cautious because that determination, and I just learned this two days ago myself, is actually made by New Brunswick Medicare by the information that's provided to New Brunswick Medicare. So although you may not even qualify to be uh, under Medicare, you still may qualify to be a resident for the property tax purposes. So the important thing you have to remember is if you have a non-resident or even someone living in Ontario that's moving in, uh, Nova Scotia that's moving in, you want to make sure that they file their, you know, get in touch with NB Medicare because if they are moving here as a principal residence, they need to switch their medical anyway from whatever province they're in to the province they're coming. And I didn't know this, but the New Brunswick uh, Property Tax Office relies on the information provided to, to New Brunswick Medicare, the actual documentation, not the determination. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. Number five, the province of New Brunswick offers an equalized payment plan for property taxes that must be accepted by a bank in lieu of payments to the bank. First of all, before you answer that question, how many of you have, have clients or even yourself they get really annoyed when property taxes become part of your mortgage payment and it go, it, it, it's really only really annoying when it goes from a non-owner occupied to an owner occupied because the bank will of course always adjust based on that higher rate because that's all that's pending and they have no evidence they're going to be accepted which means the bank is going to collect money on a property tax thing doesn't exist. The good news is your clients don't lose the money, it goes into a savings account. The bad news is your client is now coming with, up with a budgetary amount that they didn't budget for. So it is true that the province has an equalized payment plan. It's also true that a lot of banks will accept that in lieu of them making the taxes through the province. It's also true that the province uh, will set up that equalized payment and I believe there are ways that you can technically pay after May but you're not paying any interest on those late payments. But what is also false is that the bank, they are the gold, help, they hold the gold. And what do we know about that? The golden, the golden rule. They have the gold, they make the rules. If they say that property taxes are part of their payment, they just are. The reason why I bring this up is because if it does come up in a, in a conversation when you're talking about a property and you've all had this conversation with a client who is going into an owner-occupied state from a non-owner-occupied, um, it's just a good tip to know in case they haven't thought of it and it makes you look like a rock star. Well, it makes you them realize you are a rock star. Number six, and this one's a little fun, and I'm going to actually give you the time to answer this one. The FLIP program, or the FLIP program, refers to a program used for tracking houses sold in under six months in the province of New Brunswick. Did anybody think true? Good, good. <laughs> and the reason why I bring up FLIP, FLIP is one of those things, it's the diamond in the rough. It's the thing that you actually shouldn't see almost in your entire career. But if you do see it and you don't know what it is, it's the quickest way to lose the commission on that transaction. And I don't think of them as ways of you losing your commission. I think of them as you taking courses on things that you should never do again. So if you ever have to do cut that check, it's just a really expensive course. The FLIP program is actually the Farm Land Identification Program. Its utilization, it was in order to save farmers the issue of dealing with high property taxes because they already had enough, of course, to deal with on their plate. Now the way the FLIP program works is if you have a registered firm, and by the way, 15 years ago we had over 3,000 firms in New Brunswick and now we have less than 300. So the FLIP program is real and it's all over the place because a lot of these dismantled firms remain in the FLIP program. The way it worked is that when you had your property taxes, they gave you a greatly reduced rate. 
that property taxes were not forgiven, they were deferred, which means they, you owe them, but you don't owe them now, right? The minute you stop being a firm, whatever back taxes are technically owed become due using a formula that they use. They do drop off years at the end. There are, uh, I believe, reduction calculations, but the only one that can tell you what the payout would be would be the FLIP program department people. So if you're ever dealing with land, ever dealing with land, uh, that's outside the city, and it may not look like a farm. Um, the good news is the lawyer always catches it. A uh, lawyer should always catch it. But we're not around until after you've signed the agreement. So if it flip it is apparent on the property and you all have access to Service New Brunswick, it's a very quick thing to check. If you're dealing with vacant land, make sure it's not in flip. Because if it is, that doesn't mean anything t crazy. The buyer may be deciding to use it for a hobby farm or continuing on or going to plant crops and wants to keep um, these, this tax-free status indefinitely or until they sell and run through the same issue. But it can be a major tax implication for a buyer that they won't even really know about for a period after they close it, and that's when the call happens. So no, no one's tracking your sales other than yourselves. Your professional organization is always interested in how many houses you guys flip every six months. Number seven, an estoppel certificate is valid for 30 days from the date of issue. Who says true? Good. Who thinks false? The falses win. An estoppel certificate is technically only valid. They use the term the scintilla of time. Scintilla of time refers to a moment in time that's frozen and captured. An estoppel certificate is only good to the moment of time it is prepared is not technically valid for any period after it. The reason why we need estoppel certificates is their monthly updated states of health of a condominium corporation. What's relevant to a buyer, whether there's any pending major repairs that they're aware of, let's keep in mind that things that they aren't aware of that haven't gone or come to light that are after a closing would be the no, dif no different than you had a roof that just went bad the next year, it just happens. But prior to that, anything they do know about, special assessments, money owing, changes in the, in the bylaws or declarations, they're no longer allowing pets, these are things that are incredibly important and they all come up in that estoppel certificate. It's only one page. But from the legal perspective, from your perspective, estoppel certificates are generally accepted being valid for the month that they were prepared in. So that doesn't mean 30 days, that doesn't mean 60 days, that doesn't mean two days. If it was prepared on December 30th, and the closing is in January, the lawyer will most likely require another estoppel certificate. So what happened was, you have to keep in mind that estoppel certificates are part of due diligence, and traditionally anything that a buyer is doing for due diligence for themselves, it was required by the buyer. At some point down the road, I think about 10 years ago, when I was teaching that it's easier for the, for the vendor to have that information to be able to find out where the estoppel comes from, because it's not easy to find out often who a board is and where they come from, I had suggested in a much earlier seminar that it should be uh, the vendor's realtor that's maybe inquiring it. And somehow that turned into, uh, now it's like almost default that the vendor pays for the first estoppel. It's actually in your new forms that the vendor pays for that. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't. It's a good way for a vendor to show that this is a clean bill of health. It'd be no different than producing an appraisal report that they got the year before. They're giving more information that they may or may not have to spend money on in order to sell their house. So having your vendor prepare and pay for, order and pay for that estoppel is good. Just be mindful as to what their actual use is and when they're actually useful. And then everything else will fall into place. It's kind of like those pictures you look at the wall and they're blurry and then after you look at them the right way they become clear and then eventually you can walk around in a gallery full of them and just see those 3D images. Well with an estoppel, just know that they're technically only accepted by a lawyer for the month they're prepared in. So if it's closing on January 15th and the estoppel is prepared on January 1st, we're not going to order one. The reason why we don't order a second one in that case is because generally where they're only updated every month, unless there was truly something severe that occurred that a special notice went out, and there's also <coughs> excuse me, provisions in the forums to deal with that, um, when they ask for that estoppel certificate and they produce it, they're saying, this is a clean bill of health, take this and go, and we don't order another one because it won't get updated until the next month anyway. So even if we ordered another one, we would get the identical one back. The lawyers will generally accept them. Title insurance also says that it covers a, a buyer for as long as the lawyer can show that they requested it and for whatever reason or another it couldn't be produced by the closing date. That is one of the items that are technically covered under title insurance policies too. So just when you're dealing with a condo and you're the seller and you're or the buyer and you're talking about that estoppel, 
just keep in mind, just be mindful of it. If you're signing the agreement and the stop is going to be, and you're signing the agreement on December 30th and the closing is in February, you know, you might want to say that the vendor is going to provide that estoppel, um, but you might be more careful on the timing. Now, if it's closing on January 7th, please don't put in the agreement you want it for January 1st. It's okay to order a second one because that vendor may find the information in that estoppel very, very important on whether they're even going to proceed. So one of the reasons for getting it as soon as you do the agreement is, hey, if there's a special assessment, they might say, well, I don't got to pay for it, but I don't think I want to live through it either, right? If they're tearing every unit up to put rewiring through, that'd be important for a buyer to buy. And guess where it's going to be? In the estoppel certificate, OK? That's a long answer to a short question, but um, does anybody have a question about the estoppel certificate? I think that's, and the reason why that's so important is that I'm going to be covering the new forms at the end of this. Um, OK. Number eight, the seller has countered a first, this is a fun one because this comes up a lot more times than not. And I've seen even seasoned realtors of many years get this one wrong. So this one is one of the most important ones you need to, and I'll tell you why. You are enjoying the second year of a seller's market that I can tell you hasn't really appeared in about 15 years. So enjoy this while it lasts, but also know the time to get answers and responses are gone. The house that you were looking at an hour ago may actually be sold the hour later, and you end up having a lot of very upset clients. So understanding the field you're in is the first step. Understanding the answer to this question is the second. Where a seller has countered a first offer and is faced with an offer from a second purchaser, the vendor must wait for a rejection or expiry of the counteroffer before being able to accept the offer from the second purchaser. In other words, you have an offer accepted, so they've, they've presented an offer, and the vendor has said, uh, I want a couple of things changed. Send it back to them, and they have until 5 o'clock tomorrow to, to respond. Meanwhile, offer number two has come in. The realtor has done right and said, we have an offer on the table, uh, but presents the offer to the vendor. The vendor says, no conditions? No. Dump the first guys. I'm taking the second guys. The vendor doesn't have to wait for the response. If the response hasn't come, unless it's stated as being irrevocable, unless it's stated as being irrevocable. The original forms, the original standard forms that you had as a purchase and sale agreement did allow for the opposite of that because it used the word irrevocable, okay? That's gone. That was changed a long time ago and a lot of people haven't caught up with that. So know that when you're making an offer, unless an offer is irrevocable, and even then they may not want to accept an irrevocable offer in a seller's market, if an offer is not irrevocable and they generally are not, you're only open to accept it within the time frame they've given you to accept it without change. But that doesn't mean you have all of that time to make that decision. It's no different than if you're looking at a, a property and your client says, well, should we make an offer? And you say, maybe tomorrow, right? If you're going to delay the time, just know that they can decide tomorrow to take it off the market before the end of the day. They had it advertised for sale, but they changed their mind. And that happens too. What happens when you have a listing as a seller and you're showing it for six months and they just got, you know, they've had offers, they've had this, they've had that, but they just get tired of it and they say, I'm not selling anymore. Uh, you know, we haven't come to the price that we had agreed on in your CMA and therefore we've gone six months. I've had a few offers, but I have not accepted them. I'm done. I'm not selling. All we're left with is disappointment because really there's no other recourse that we would have, of course, unless someone buys it within six months from someone that looked at it while it was listed, in which you case you have full recourse from your listing agreement. So that's a scary one. And, I, I, and look, I could tell by the look of surprise on a lot of your faces that you may not realize that. But what I want to also caution you about, if you do that sort of thing, you're not going to be very popular. The second thing I want to caution you about is you can win a battle, but you will lose a war. So keep that in mind when you have, cl your client can dictate your actions because they are your client, only to the level of your being comfortable with them dictating them. So control your client's expectations, and that one's going to get really easy. Besides, realistically, before you even make an offer, the parameters for that offer almost should be discussed in any event. So that the, those solutions, those answers, those counteroffers don't need to be thought about. They're either acceptable or they are not. Because at the end of the day, what are we talking about? So half the time those items are going back and forth with represent one half of 1% of what we're talking about the sale price being. They're humming and hawing over whether the fridge and stove are included. Go buy a new fridge and stove. All right? What question on that? Maybe I'll get the so false. They don't have to wait. Maybe I'll get the jazz fridge. Uh, 
Um, just a quick question with regards to that. Sure. So if you were, Jack, if you were to say, you talk about the irrevocable and maybe the language. So but let's just say you get an offer and instead of, you know, you're maybe going to go back once or twice instead of putting this, you know, you put the first counter offer on the agreement, mm -hmm. um, showing that it's been signed and presented by the vendor. Mm -hmm. um, and you push it back to whoever the other agent is and their client. If, you know, they come back and let's just say there was a, a they countered your counter offer, for instance, and you went back and said, well, here's our counter offer. And you wrote an email to, to track that and said, um, irrevocable of, you know, here's my vendor's response. It says irrevocable of 9 p.m. this evening. What would that do? Is that that language? I want to caution you about the third thing, uh, which is what we're going to be f uh, focusing on forms. You are obligated. Although in, in common law, contracts can now be established because a statute of fraud has been rescinded. Uh, so that requirement, that legal requirement that all of uh, contracts uh, involving land must be in writing is no longer, it's just gone. But that doesn't excuse or eliminate your requirement to have the proper forms in place for all real estate transactions pursuant to your own professional society. That's why the real estate board is actually an incorporated company. Un it's a creature of statute. So you're, when you're talking about emails back and forth, be very careful. Um, although they may be valid, the law is very gray. So if you want to do it right, you have to do it by amendment forms properly. Now, if you want, remember, clear language is what we'll cover at the end of it. Clear language is key. So if you write in your counter offer, if the counter offer um, goes back to them, or the offer goes in, and they can just say no, and that's the end of the matter. So that should help you understand more the reason why it makes more sense that a person can, doesn't have to wait for the, for the counter to expire before they change their mind. They can also just say no from the beginning. Just a plain no. No other parts of the no, just a capital N, capital O. Right? Does that answer the question? Yeah. So, but I don't want you all to start going out and running irrevocable in your contracts because you are, you're going to have a hard time getting people to, A, accept it. That's why it was removed from your standard form in the first place because it's also not really fair. You know, to have a person possibly pass up on an opportunity to sell their house because they're having to wait for one that may not even come to fruition on the table, it seems kind of counterproductive in the first place. And look, time is everything. Uh, the early bird gets the worm. If you're the realtor that's getting up at 2 in the afternoon, likely all the new listings that went on this morning that your client's been waiting forever to see is probably already gone this year. You know, next year could be a buyer's market again, and you can pick and pull. But for now, this is where we're at. Uh, number nine, and this is important because I know that you guys all deal with FinTrack. I know there's been some discrep uh, discrepancies on the timing of when that FinTrack gets fulfilled, but ideally, they want you to fulfill it at the beginning, and most of the time, it gets fulfilled at the end. But in FinTrack, one of the required documents that you are, that one of the documents you're not required to have, but will work in that portion, I believe, is a birth certificate. Keep in mind that they are a uh, birth certificate. You, I think you guys have a passport, driver's license, military ID. So here's the question. A person born in New Brunswick may use either a valid passport or a birth certificate to own real property in their name. It, it is false. There are some very, very, very um, uh, few exceptions. Uh, if you're born in Canada, you have to use a birth certificate. It's just plain and simple in New Brunswick. And the reason why is because you can get your birth certificate reprinted or reordered anytime. It's a little inconvenient. You can get it in New Brunswick in under a week, I believe. Uh, you can get the name and confirmation in under two days. Uh, other provinces may be more difficult. Now, there are some exceptions, so I don't want you to take this off and think of it as a hard and fast rule. Like in Quebec, the baptismal certificate was used for many years, and they were secular. So the, they kept those records in separate places, never centralized them. And by the time they did centralize them, there's been lots of fires and floods and whatnot. So there is oftentimes an accepted rule of people born in Quebec uh, where they're born before a certain year because there really is no better information to obtain. But generally speaking, although you're not required to get a birth certificate uh, at all for your FinTrack, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because if your client does not have a birth certificate and they're born in Canada and your closing is going to be quick, it may not be as quick as you're hoping. Just good to know. I'm not sure how you bring that up in conversation other than if you do your FinTrack requirements earlier and you ask them if you, it's be kind of a funny opener to the conversation. Are you born in Canada? Yes. Do you have a birth certificate? Yes. Good. I don't need that. Do you have a driver's license? Yeah, OK, I can use that. And how about a passport? But hearing that first yes makes you know, don't, don't pack it. Don't put it away. 
Now, we've made some exceptions when we're up against the wall. The client's got it packed. We try to say we'll bring it in the next day, and we do get it. We actually hold documentation from registration until that happens, and we're always a little bit terrified until we do. Now, the province does give us a window, and title insurance gives us a window, and that's how we get over that. Everything I do is part of a system and part of a protocol. It l lets me get through it. It's like a Plinko board. Every time it hits one obstacle, it's going to go left or right, and I'm trying to land in green in the bottom every time. Right? Number 10, a valid registrable. Now, valid and registrable means you don't have to worry about whether it had the signatures. It's a valid registrable. I just wanted to get over that. I get real, sometimes get real technical on me. A valid registrable, uh, registered power of attorney uh, can be used to complete a transaction on behalf of a seller or a purchaser. It's true. That's right. It's true, and it's also false. <laughs> it's mostly true. The only thing you have to remember about whether it's true or not is does it actually have the power in it? Powers of attorney can range from anywhere from you can authorize someone only to wear your shoes right up to they can decide, uh, they can do anything except for marry or divorce. So you wouldn't want someone to have that power of attorney, right? You come home and you're, anyway, I won't get down that road. But you can do anything, you can make them as broad and, broad and sweeping as you want. They're very specific sometimes. Your vendor's leaving the country. They need a power of attorney signed to allow them to complete the transaction with you. Those are good every time. Don't have to worry about that. If it's a seller, the power of attorney will work as long as it's valid and registered and it has the power in it. If it's not registered, get me it. Get me it and let me take a glance at it and tell me if it's original and I'll tell you in two seconds if it's valid. It's that quick. But if it's not, you'd hate to find out <laughs> down the road that they weren't actually the ones that were allowed to sell it. And look, this is an exercise you actually need to do before you even list it, right? I'm saying that uh, because oftentimes it becomes a little confusing if it's in one name and the person's the attorney and the vendor's, you know, in home and all that. Just remember that it, it is a phone call away and documentation that you need to see, just like their driver's license to make sure that their name is Jim and not something else, right? Now, where it's false is that there are, and look, it, it, is, it is true in most of the ways because a power of attorney, if it gives the power to buy, sell, sue, do whatever, it has that power. So where is it false? It's only false because certain banks will not allow a power of attorney to be used when purchasing a property. And if your client doesn't know who they are, you might want to figure out who they are. And unfortunately, you can't because who they are changes based on their policy. The few that ruin it for the many. One person gets a transaction done and a bank loses $20,000 because a proper power of attorney was in place. Guess what? It's now changed the policy for power of attorney for that bank until they, until they take a loss the other way by not doing it the way they did it before. So TD Bank, for example, and I'm not picking on anybody, but TD Bank is a prime example of one that is always uh, not allowed uh, a power of attorney to be used in signing a mortgage documents on a purchase. Now, if that's changed, and it may have changed, I apologize to TD Bank, but the 22 years I've been doing this and the 15,000 transactions I've handled, let me speak from a little bit of experience. And if they've changed their policy, it was this morning and they haven't told me about it. So err on the side of caution and ask the banker. Uh, get the client to ask the banker, but a verbal answer wouldn't be enough because the actual mortgage broker may not know the answer to that question. Do you get it? And remember, these are cobweb questions. These aren't things that I'm, I'm wanting you to keep at the top of your head. They're things that will hopefully trigger and if they're not, the answer is always, let's call a lawyer. Let's call a lawyer because the lawyer is going to tell us in two seconds. This isn't a 25-minute telephone conversation. This is two seconds, right? Okay. On an estate sale where the original will is lost, a lawyer-certified copy of the will can be registered and used to complete the transaction. True. Who says true? true. Who says false? <laughs> The thing you have to always remember is there's always going to be two different answers in this room. So what does that tell you? That tells you that everybody sees things different, interprets things differently, so it's up to us to make sure that we have a meeting of the mind when we're putting contracts together. The answer is false. A lawyer-certified copy of a will is just that. It's a lawyer-certified copy of a will. It is not registrable without court action. You can always register a copy of something, but it's a long delay and a lot of money. Original wills can be registered in the registry system and letters of probate. If they don't have a will or the will gets probated or, you know, they can, one of those two things have to happen in order for there to be something else to happen to divest somebody of the property. So what makes an original, uh, what makes a will um, valid and registrable? Well, there's a little trick 
And again, don't try to remember all of this. Call the lawyer, but just know that there's a trick. Know that there's a problem. And then that way, when you know there's a will involved, that'll, all I really wanted to do is trigger you to ask the question, right? So with a will, if it's an original will, but it doesn't have an affidavit of execution attached, it, it, you can't register it. It's useless, right? That means lawyers, well, it, doesn't, it means it could be bad. Lawyers back in the day used to do this little trick. And I've never done this in my 22 years from day one because I learned about this 22 years ago. So lawyers would draft your will. They'd be your witnesses, but they wouldn't attach the affidavit of execution and give it to you. So why would they do that? So that eventually when something happened, the lawyer would have to do the work because the lawyer would be the one that would have to now sign the affidavit saying they're the ones that witnessed the will. Because it's not registrable without it. It's still valid, but it's not registrable. And you guys are only concerned about registrable. So if there's no affidavit, that means we have one or two options. Well, three options. We can forget about the transaction, which isn't really an option. We can find, track down at least one of those witnesses to that will and get them to sign a new affidavit, which I do all the time. Um, and the third option would be to apply to court and have a letters probate issued. Because once letters probate issued, you're off to the races. That's, that's a cl nice, clean power. There's no question. And by the way, that will also has to have a very specific power of sale. If a will doesn't have a power of sale to the executor, the executor can do nothing. So if the will gets registered and it's left to the beneficiaries, it's the beneficiaries that usually have to sign unless the executor is given a power of sale. So again, these are very specific things that I don't expect you to remember, read, or analyze. They're things that let you know that there's always a, you know, a boogeyman in the bush. So when you come across these odd ones, you just need to remember to ask the question. Number 12. Any questions about that? Yeah, just about estate sales and power of attorney, Jack. Um, what should be on the listing sheet uh, when, when you're dealing with either a power of attorney or a, an estate sale? Is it the, what's on the title on planet? Is it the executor? Is it the power of attorney? What should be on the list sheet? Well, let me ask you the question, uh, because I always say that if you understand the question uh, fully, then the answer usually materializes. Okay. So who owns the property when you list it, it would in, be the in this scenario? Let's say if it's the estate. It's always going to be the estate, because it's always going to be the vendor. It's their house, unless right. they've given it to somebody else. So the vendor can be a lot of different people, because it can be the person appointed by the court. It can be all the beneficiaries of the estate. If there's no will, it could be a lot of people. But generally, your seller is always who's on title to the property. Okay. And if it is an estate, it's on who's titled the property, comma, estate. Yes, okay. You don't have to get into who the specific attorney is or who the executor is. They would sign and they'd put their name there. And if they're doing that, all you have to do is put next to their name, POA or executor. When they sign. When they or, sign. Okay. Yeah. So that the, that executor or power of attorney does not, shouldn't be on the list. Uh, no, because realistically, vendor, the only the time vendor. it would ever become relevant is if a buyer is fidgety about buying from an estate because they're concerned that somebody is going to pop this thing on the person who had the authority to sell is it really in a dispute with all the siblings and they're now filing an action to bar them. That's the kind of stuff you really want to know. Like, a, am I going to do all this work and then find out that this person isn't the one that's authorized to sell? Or do they have the kind of power that can and should be and would be stripped from them in the process? I am talking fast. Is it everybody? Okay. So if um, the power of attorney is signing through dot loop, how would you put the POA in there? Like, you know what I mean? So if we're Well, you have to put their name. Their name. So their last name would be Yousef bracket POA bracket. Okay. So add that into the dot sure. loop system instead of just the regular, yeah. Or you can, I mean, look, it doesn't have to have it there for it to be valid as long as someone is not going to dispute the fact that they were the POA. So, I mean, look, the fact that it's not there okay. is not going to be the end of the world. But if you want to have creative ways to put information, and in, I just used the tab before okay. to stick it in there so okay. that people know that it's there. But it's not relevant to a buyer unless the buyer is that one-tenth of one percent that's fidgety about buying from anybody that doesn't actually own it, wants to look that seller in the eye, um, which never happens. Well, except for this morning, right, Justin? Sorry, I'll fill you guys in on that after the <laughs> seminar. For the first time this morning in 22 years, I visited a property that I worked on. I make it a specific point never to visit a property because I never want to give an opinion on the property. After it's all done, sure, I'll come over for a beer. But before that, I'm never really there. And I don't ever cut checks either. Today, I did both. I visited a property and I cut, it a, check, cut a check and I got to play in the snow for a while. And uh, we'll fill you guys all in later. Um, let's get to the, so the, the, we're good on the question. You have another one? So I'm list actually listing a, a state sale this weekend. Yeah. So I don't have to put the executor's name on it, just a state 
of so-and-so? If you're real, I qualify every question I give with if your real estate board or if your real estate office has a protocol in place that says do it this way, okay. then my suggestion to you is always to do it that way. The reason why is because even if everybody is doing something wrong, as long as we're all doing it the same way and accepted to be generally understood the same way, it drastically reduces the possibility of there being a misunderstanding. So if we all know blue as green and green as blue, eventually green will become blue and blue will become green. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if there, if there, we, we started a thing a few years ago called best practices and we were trying to get all of the real estate offices to kind of meet and accept what those best practices are. Um, like for example, the, the biggest one that always comes up is on that first page of the agreement, when you make the offer, you put the offer price in and us lawyers get all kinds of manner of thing when we get to the final contract. And sometimes it's crossed out completely. Sometimes it says see counter offer. Sometimes it has the actual other price in there. You're not sure if that was the original offer or some other offer. Although the answer is very, very, very easy, the contract that you prepare and send off, once you produce it, is no longer your property. It belongs to the person that's received it unless you rescind it. So you're not really allowed to, you really shouldn't be amending anything on that original offer. And Technically, the reason why we do is because the alternative is to redraft the contract and enter it again when you make a major change that can't be dealt with on a modification. And who in the hell wants to do that? So we've generally accepted that we can do some types of modifications on documents. But where has that landed us after all these years? Every office still does it differently. And everybody preaches that this is the best way and this is the worst way. And all I'm saying is, I don't care. Just pick a way. Because as long as we have a meeting of the minds as to what it means, then our clients, if they have any conversations with us, would have a meeting of the mind of what it means. And as long as we all agree on what it means, there's usually no disappointment, which means there's usually no litigation or talk of litigation. Because remember, my favorite thing to, to remind realtors is being right is only 5% of the fight. Like someone can jump up and down uh, because they, they don't get what they want. Like, you know, I use the example of going into McDonald's. And these are things I talk to my own clients about all the time, just so you know. If a client comes in and they're really upset on closing day about something ridiculous, and I see that glimmer that I can, might be able to get through to them, I remind them of the Big Mac example. You can go into any McDonald's after this meeting and order a Big Mac combo. And it might be inconceivable to you that they tell you, sorry, we're the Big Macs. Right? But if they tell you that, really, you only have three choices. Eat something else, eat somewhere else, or jump up and down like an idiot until someone gives you a $50 gift card. But the one thing that's not going to happen is you're not going to get a Big Mac. So let's focus on the things that are in front of us. Let's forget about the other one. And the minute you think there's no cost to that $50 gift card, two things have now cost you something. One, you're 10 times more likely to do it again with, a, with minor provocation, right? So what have you now traded for? You've traded a little bit of your soul, in my opinion. We get caught up in little tiny issues that turn into something big because people have this feeling of, of entitlement. And it grows every year. Now you see that kind of take a little bit of a flip-flop on a seller's market and it gets really confusing, right? Because normally it's the buyer uh, beating up and lately who's beating up? Correct. Where does that leave us when we are in a seller's market and three years later we're in a buyer's market and your, your buyer from three years ago is saying, hey, I didn't have to do all of this stuff. I didn't get any of this stuff. You know, what's going on with this stuff? And then you're going to break into this conversation about sellers and buyers markets and the, how the, you know, you, nobody can predict and that your name isn't Nostradamus. It'll go nowhere. They're still going to list with somebody else. <laughs> the last question. HST, and look, HST is also another one I've seen many, many realtors cut checks on. So please, don't have an opinion on HST, and then you'll never have a problem. HST, <laughs> I'd ask an accountant about that. A determination of, uh, well, I'm not going to answer the question before I ask it. HST is only charged on land sold by developers and new construction. False. Yeah, a resounding false. Because what's the thing I've taught everybody in this, well, hopefully I've taught everybody in this room. If you cut it in two, there's nothing to do. If you cut it in three, there's HST. That's a general rule. That is not a hard and fast rule. Just know that if you're dealing with someone that's, oh, I'm going to cut a piece off. I'm going to sell my house, but I'm cutting the piece off before I do. Or I'm cutting a piece off, and I'm going to sell the piece, but I'm going to keep my house. The very first thing you should be asking them is, when you bought this place, was it this 100% of it before? No, no, no. I, caught, I cut one off and sold it there 12 years ago. Well, if you cut it in two, there was nothing to do. It doesn't matter about the time lapse. You've cut it in three, very potentially there's HST. 
But who makes that determination? Because I get all kinds of fights on closing day between lawyers as to whether HST is applicable or not. And I'm like, guys, there's, there's no need to fight. Only a vendor can determine if there's HST applicable. A buyer really has no right to say that you are an HST registrant or not. It's the vendor that makes that determination. The problem for you guys is that the vendor hasn't made that determination. You're drifting in the wind on that question on whether it's in the contract or not. As a realtor, you always want the price to be reflective of everything. So you never want to have a price plus HST if you can avoid it. So ideally, in a perfect world, whenever you're making an offer, if there is HST, and your client's accepting that it's 345000 not three hundred, the offer could be 345000 including any applicable HST. Keep in mind, if HST doesn't turn out to be applicable, um, this is, still happens. The buyer still buys it for an amount they've accepted, and the seller still sells it for an amount they've accepted. And I run into this too. So why don't you just try to focus on the price that your client is expecting to pay out of their pocket and make it inclusive of any applicable HST from the buyer side and from the vendor side, for God's sakes, go ask your accountant if you should be charging HST on this transaction because you've gone over the threshold on what percent you've renovated or you've claimed a, if you've claimed a, a capital gain exemption or a reduction in value based on business use. You wouldn't know any of this, but your vendor would. But your vendor may have followed the amounts of a, 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 an accountant's advice, and your vendor might not all, all, also know all of this. So the point of the question is, if you're dealing with vacant land primarily, um, that's the only one that becomes iffy. If you're dealing with new construction or whatever, you can follow what your client is generally saying because it's a, almost a no-brainer. But when you're dealing with like multi-unit residential, there should never be HST on it. It's used residential. It doesn't matter if there's 10 or 1 or 20, but look, I've had vendors say, nope, it's applicable and I'm charging it, and I'm collecting it. Great, so the purchaser should know now, what am I willing to pay for that property, and whatever that number is, as long as it's inclusive of HST, we've got no problem. The only problem you're gonna have is if it turns out it's not applicable and your buyer thinks that they could have paid a lot less. But you're not saying to them, it's 300,000 plus HST, let's make an offer for 345, because the HST portion is kind of irrelevant. You're saying, you know, they want 300,000 for it. I don't care if there's HST or not, what are you willing to pay for it? Well, I want to pay 320. Great. The offer is 320 inclusive of any applicable HST. We don't give a crap if we're the buyer. We just know what we want to spend. Right? So that answers that question. That concludes the cobweb questions. Hope you had fun with those. How much time do I have? That's going to carry me into, I just want to briefly cover over the new condo clauses because I was, the one thing I do very little of is condos. I rely on Matt DeWitt in the office, who's our condo guy, to do all of that. So I, I must warn you, I'm not nearly as experienced as Mr. DeWitt. But I have seen these two forms, and I'm hoping you have too. And the major thing that you need to remember with these two forms is always use them. Like, you must use them. One is presented by the seller, and one is, by the buyer, and one is presented by the seller. So you're always going to have them if you're dealing in a condo, right? The problem with these uh, clauses is although they're always made with the best intentions, they always have a few intricacies that may cause a lot of issues without you realizing it. Like if it's a new condominium and you give the person less, less than 10 days, there is a provision in the condominium act says they can't have less than 10 days. So, hey, listen, it's like anything else. If no one notices, no one cares, no one says anything, we're done the transaction, everybody's happy. But what do people do with uh, all these little things if they're upset? They, they go find them and they rely on them and they stick to them and they throw them at you. So I'm not going to get into all of the stuff in the clauses other than to remind you if you haven't read them carefully or if you have any questions about them, you should ask and you should read because these are still a little bit tricky, but for the most part they work as long as you make sure you use them. Uh, I'm going to go to contract clause and if I do have time I want to come back to the specific clauses, but I want to keep this to an hour and I don't know how much time I've spent. I never timed myself, by the way. Good enough. I want to talk a little bit more first then because this came up just yesterday and I've had three or four issues in the last week dealing with clauses uh, and how they're worded. And this is more of a cobweb issue than you might realize because this time of year, you're drafting a lot of clauses very quickly. The standardized forms are there to keep you from having to do a lot of that and in a clean offer, it, there's no clauses, there's no conditions. It's just straight up check, fill in names, price, and that's it. We all love those. Those are the gold standard of real estate transactions, but they are represent 5% of them. We always have, they have to do this, or they have to do that, or we want to check on the financing, we want to do this or that. 
So the two key questions I want you to remember this time of year, don't let the cobwebs build up. Be sharp because you have to ask yourself two questions every single time you have any type of a condition. Anything, financing, anything, does not matter. What does the client want? What's going to happen if it doesn't get done? If I can't read or understand those two things and that clause, you've opened yourself up and everybody else to a lot of misunderstanding. I always tell realtors that I will do everything I can to complete your transaction because I understand a lot of the time it's just people that have gotten off track um, and it turns into something much bigger than it is, this feeling of self-entitlement. I always tell realtors, I really wish you guys would just give me a heads up. This one was sticky. <laughs> like, try not to let us double-end anything that's truly, really sticky, right? And not because we can't help, still help resolve it, because we're very limited on what we can do to resolve it. And ultimately, I'm not a litigator anyway, so me representing and having to withdraw, you know, some realtors may say, well, you know, I don't want you to have to withdraw, whatever. I don't litigate anyway. So I'd be withdrawing either way if it came to a point where people can't agree. If there's no meeting of the minds, all I can do is advise them, but the advice is always the same, and if you're not sure what they are, go to youssefflawgroup.com. There's 17 one-minute videos, and one of them is what happens if something happens after my closing. There's five steps. They never change. So if I'm faced up on a condition on closing day or pre-closing where something hasn't been done or whatever, or it's a week after your Collins Klein, uh, you know, losing their minds, Get them to spend about 90 seconds and find out what's up. Do you know what I mean? It might save you a world of grief. Because people often come in on closing dates and say, well, it's not professionally cleaned. I'm not closing until it is. Like, I'm not, I'm, it's not professionally cleaned. It's clean, but not to my standards. The only person that could have known how clean their standards would have possibly been before that date is the person, no, is, well, and possibly you. So if, if your client is super picky, if they're an engineer from, uh, from wherever and they've been, uh, you, know, you know your clients, you know what they're going to be like, if you see that stuff, be extra careful on the wording of your, cl of your clauses. Use definitive language, right? Like don't use loose language because contra preferentum will always get you in the end. If it's vague, it's going to be interpreted against you. Definitive language, use words like immediately release. You know, uh, is there, is there, what happens if it's partially done? If you can't answer the question of what do they want and what happens when it's not done, and you don't recognize where it's a situation where it could be partially done, but not done to their satisfaction, you're getting yourself, all you're doing is opening yourself up for another half a day of angry phone calls. I literally spent more than two and a half hours on the phone dealing with an issue that turned out to be a $250 issue. Now, it's not a matter of cost savings. It's not a matter of me saying, oh, no, I'm just going to give that to them and let them drift off into the breeze. It's about trying to make sure that the two people that both wanted the exact same thing actually get that thing. When they set out, they want the same thing. But if your contracts get sticky, kick it up on the, on the wording. What is the issue? What do they want? And what happens if they don't get it? If there's a trigger clause, what happens if they don't get it? Well, if you, if you have a situation where they're supposed to remove some junk, right? You can prepare your client telling them what happens is on your pre-closing inspection, there's a junk in the air. That's supposed to be gone. Okay, well, generally what happens is if something's still here that shouldn't be here, we'll raise it with them, right? We'll tell them to remove it because there could be a perfectly plausible explanation why it's still there. But we're going to raise it, and but we also have to have that discussion. Okay, if we go to them and find out that it's just there because they forgot it or they can't come back and get it, what do we want? Well, if they don't come and get, get it by Tuesday, then I will get rid of it at a cost of $500. So what should that clause say? Should it say that the vendor, uh, the vendor solicitor undertakes to hold $1, $500 pending confirmation that the old rickety fridge in the yard has been removed? Is that it? But that's only half the question. What happens when you get to that date and the fridge is still there? What happens when the guy came there to get the rid of the fridge, but for some, he had a heart attack in the yard? Like, I, I know I'm getting a little extreme, but there's all kinds of reasons why a condition doesn't happen. And the more we prepare for our clients for what they actually want, and what they get if it doesn't happen, if these conversations happen in advance and they just take one phone call, it eliminates the 420 phone calls. I had two clients that this morning proved that unreasonableness can hit any level it wants to get to. Um, the objective is to recognize that, grab it, and then deflate it before it keeps expanding. So cannot complete without agreement. You have to have to remind your clients of that. This is the psychology that I use all the time with my clients, uh, and it's not about me trying to get them to accept something they shouldn't. It's about me putting their true expectations and, and uh, what they deserved in check, right? 
So on the closing, when you're doing the final inspection, and before we do that, we always remind the client, you know, we need the three elements to bake the cake. I am the baker. I need the milk, the eggs, and the flour. One is your money. Easy. You get a bank draft, drop it off. One's the bank's money. Well, you never know when that's going to get sent, but it generally comes that day. If we didn't get insurance until 2 o'clock on the closing date, you know, what are you going to do? But if it's a big five, normally we get it in the morning. And we need a clean inspection, which is a resolved inspection if it's not clean or a clean one if it is. So what does that mean? When your client's losing their mind over it not being professionally clean, they have to appreciate that they've created that situation that precludes us from being able to resolve and close the thing until the issue is resolved. If a lawyer is on both sides, the lawyer cannot give legal advice to either side or favor one side or the other. What the lawyer can do is have a discussion with the realtor to try to find out what the understanding was. And nine times out of ten, both of them understood it completely differently. And that's what usually starts it. No, like if you're dealing with someone in your office, it's really easy. You can go have a chat like that. You know, what are we going to do about this? Well, my client wants to make sure this is done. That's great. If it's with somebody else, you may not have that opportunity or whatever. So. Um, you can't complete without agreement, and sometimes just reminding somebody of that is enough to make them realize that that third element for the baker to bake the cake is way more important than what's coming next. I often use this example too. Um, if someone offered you a job tomorrow, and it, they said to you that we want to hire you, and, and you said, well, what's the pay? The pay is whatever you want. We have lots of money, and when you ask them what the job is, they say it's to be angry for eight hours a day. You'd want $20 million dollars right? A, a year for that. Be angry eight hours a day, but you do it every day and you're not getting paid nickels for it, right? I mean, people do it all the time. That 25 cents, they got ripped off at the meter and they're bitching about it for three days <laughs> all over Facebook. I am really glad that Facebook has finally got to the point where people don't really listen to those people that give like, okay, the one star review you got out of 800,000 reviews. We might want to take that one with a bit of grain of salt. Um, because like I said, being right it's only 5% of the fight, and the most important thing is that a minor infraction of a contract does not necessarily lead to frustration of that contract. So time is of the essence is critical on timing for getting conditions met and all of that, and a person can always take the hard view. Sorry, time is of the essence. You're out, right? But minor infractions on closing date are not those. So if the person didn't clean it well enough, it's a difference of opinion. You have to appreciate that that is a gray, gray, gray area, right? They may or may not ever be satisfied, so our objective is to always either avoid those situations in advance, by even if you warn the lawyer that it's a particularly contentious transaction. If it's, believe it or not, the lawyer will take extra care to try to avoid that contentiousness turning into something unreasonable because it does take more time for a lawyer to take that care. So they can't take it on. You know, everybody can't be a high maintenance. Not saying they're meaning to say high maintenance client. Everybody can't be. Um, you know, special. Um, <laughs> but certainly we want to focus the energy on the ones that are. Certainly we want to, we want to recognize uh, which class our client fits into and give them the best service we can based on that client. What works for one client, of course, isn't going to work for another. But I'm not talking law anymore. I'm talking, you know, stuff like that. I don't know if they, I don't sell real estate, so I shouldn't know anything about that. So that's it on contracts. Do we have any questions on that? Yeah. You can come is, up and is there an easier way to write out the clause on cleaning? Because that seems to be a contentious issue on almost every sale. I find that with sellers, they're happy when you give them the offer and it becomes accepted, but then they don't care from that point onwards until closing. And often the houses are not left in very good condition. Mm -hmm. So how can you correct that? Well, first of all, remember that perspective is everything. Someone's idea of clean or included or whatever or repaired uh, is going to always be different than somebody else's for a multitude of reasons. So going into that is more important than anything. The problem that you have with checklists is be you become a slave to them. And what is the person who's right up on it in that negotiation focusing on, your buyer or your seller? Oh, by the way, they're going to accept it, but just so you know, they want you to do this, 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 and this. Okay, yeah, let's get her done, right? But how much discussion, and I, look, I'm not in the room with you guys, but how much discussion really goes into what those things are and what does it mean if you don't do them? Listen, I don't mind, if you, if, just so you know. 
if you're not there and do this by this time, this is gone. So if, are you okay with that? Yeah, then just know I, I don't want to have a big discussion with you about it. But if you just create a checklist, professionally cleaned, I mean, the biggest thing I see now is servicing, paying like $800, $900. What happens when you make something in a checklist is that cost of that thing goes up pretty quick. You know, radon is like, woo, you know, it's gone a little bit crazy. Um, all kinds of things do. So the important thing is just to remember to find out what your client wants and make sure you put that in there without using checklists. But the wording I would use is depending on your client. So if, let's say your client is particularly particular. Then don't put it in there in the first place. Tell them to offer $500 less and have it professionally clean themselves before they move in. And then the person who's selling can just do it at a normal cleaning level. And the buyer's not going to walk in there and say, what? There's dust on the registers. Yeah. <laughs> right? So if your client's that particular, the way you avoid it is don't draft the clause. Don't create a situation where if that house is going to be worth $1,000 less to them because it's not going to be clean to the level you're going to know it, get them to offer $1,000 less. But do not say, but you don't got to clean it because we're going to gut it afterwards anyway. <laughs> what happens then? Not only is it bad, but they've left their garbage. Oh, they're going to haul that stuff out anyway. Guess what happens then? Now they want it cleaned to a basic level. What's your vendor going to do? Well, we're in Calgary, right? And then you get into that whole cycle again. That's just my suggestion. And I mean, this is more to Deborah. I mean, and just so people can hear. I know one of the things is we always had a lot of issues, it seemed earlier, um, with closings. So for vendors, one of the big things that we've been doing late, we go look at the house. We do a walk through the house before the purchasers and their realtors ever go. That way I can say, and we were there, or tell them, hey, listen, this is going to be an issue tomorrow, just so you know, and th just to get you set up for this, this is going to be a problem if we don't fix it now, mm -hmm. and it's going to be an issue for the, you know, the buyers and the other agents. Mm -hmm. Just so it's not my vendor to the Right, right, right. Yeah. In, yeah, no. <laughs> I think it's the expectation. You, you, you Can you someone give me an example of a uh, situation you've had recently where you've had to draft a clause because of something and you weren't sure of the wording or it might have caused you an issue? Does anybody have one they're currently working on? Either? Well, I was going to ask you one, actually. Um, so right now we're dealing with, because of how property tax, I mean, they're not out for this year currently. I don't think the, the date's yet, mm -hmm. but I think it's soon. So we have a, a particular property, um, have an offer on it. It's assessed $120,000 over what the agreed price was because of different deficiencies in property taxes haven't been appealed on that for 15 years. And so we put a clause in there and I was just wanting to see what your thought process was on it because it's supposed to close you know, within four weeks. And we put in a clause there for the, we're representing the purchaser and actually the vendor. So we put a clause in there so that the vendor, because the purchaser said, I don't want to pay $120,000 more for an assessment, like the assessed price. Can we put a clause in there so that the owner of the day on January 1, uh, appeal, make sure that she appeals the taxes based on what, you know, and whether, you know, whether the um, property assessor or, or department says, hey, listen, you know, we're going to take it down to what you paid. I'm okay with whatever the result is, but I want to make sure it gets appealed. So I guess my question to you is, should we be writing that rate right in the additional terms and conditions and what does that look like? First of all, when your client comes up with such a weird request that you can't possibly figure out how to word it, definitely refer that one to a lawyer. But I'll give you an example of how easy it is. So what's the issue? The issue is the buyer's concerned about paying higher transfer tax, they're concerned about possibly paying higher property taxes, and they're concerned about filing that appeal themselves. Okay. But situationally, where are we? We're in February. Taxes for this year haven't come out. You can only appeal within a certain window. Mm -hmm. That appeal has to be completed by a certain date, and no one can guarantee you that it's going to be successful. So on the property tax, a transfer tax, it's a non-issue. You have to pay it on the assessed value. Now, you can always appeal to the province after you get it lowered and maybe get some money back. I'm guessing that you're just going to waste some time, but you could always get that. So you don't have to worry about that part because that's automatic, right? On the property taxes, well, technically, the purchaser's opinion is that it's worth 120 less. And the vendor's opinion is, I guess we're going to accept that. But what the province determines a value on a property is not relevant to either one of their opinions, right? So the answer to that becomes good, easy. But now if you want to do a wording in a contract, then you want to even, if I even wanted to hazard tackling that with a clause, I would do something along the lines of, 
The parties agree that the purchaser shall be required to appeal immediately the property tax assessment upon review of this year's property tax assessment and provide evidence of the same to the vendor, uh, to the purchaser, um, uh, within seven days of receipt. Done. Failing which, because all, all I've given you so far is the first half to the, the question. Failing which, the parties agree that the vendor shall pay, a, uh, the purchaser shall pay $2,000 less to deal with any issues of uh, additional, or $1,200 in this case, because that's all, at the end of the day, your buyer is only really being penalized $1,200, because the property taxes will take care of themselves if they're successful on appeal. As a matter of fact, your buyer will end up with a windfall, because if the property taxes go down, remember, on, there's always an adjustment for the vendor for their share of the taxes, even though they haven't come out yet. Now, a more interesting one, along the same lines is, property taxes haven't come out yet. So last year's number is all we have to work by, but there's no guarantee that's this year's number. So what do you do in that case? I'll tell you what lawyers would do in that case. The if, if it's an issue where we think it's actually going to be an issue. So in other words, it was a vacant lot last year, and this year there's a house on it. We would usually use clauses like something along the lines of, the parties agree that the property tax shall be adjusted on the day of closing as per previous year's numbers, but shall hold X number of dollars pending confirmation of this year's taxes and shall reassess or recalculate. We do that all the time, right? So is that something that... You we would bring, like, if we had that case where you just said it was vacant land last year, you know, it was $30,000 assessment, and we know, you know, they bought a $400,000 brand new house. Is that something that we would bring to your attention first before we write the contract up, or how would you want to see that? I guess my point to you is to remember that you're creating now a complication between the parties that you don't want to create. No, the person no The person should rather understand how property taxes and assessments and appeals work so that they can know based on the timing of the closing whether or not they're going to be the ones that make it. Because look, just because they paid 120 less, the province can still show up and say, no, we actually think this is worth 120 more, right? right? So I tell people this. Is I get people coming in and wanting to reassess the property when it's assessed at 10,000 more than they paid for it. And I said, is this your forever home? And they're like, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. I said, because you're planning on selling any time in the next, even if it's a thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 variant sometimes, if they're only planning on being around for a couple years, Service New Brunswick might show that they paid 120 and it's assessed at 160. It's only going to be there for a few years. As a matter of fact, I would be requesting that they don't change it because what's it costing them more? $300 a year in property taxes. Times five is $1,500. Now, if it, someone goes and the assessment's never been appealed and it's always been 160 and edging up and you see on the system they paid 120 and it's never been reduced and that guy's selling it at 160 plus, right, even though he hasn't touched it, it's going to be a lot easier sell and a lot easier buy for the person dealing with it saying that was likely a deal. <coughs> so, you, you, you know, what do they call it? Not seeing the forest for the trees? So our job as lawyers is try to anticipate the unanticipatable. Like our job is to be, try to be omnipotent, and it's, it's impossible because no one is except Jesus. Um, so all we try to do is anticipate what we can. The most important thing is our clients because they are as wide and broad as hairstyles. So if you can recognize that client, if you can control that feeling of expectation, if you can guide them through the thing that they want and keep your contracts as clean as you humanly can, work it out in the price. Don't work it out in high probability of disappointment because that's what we're now brokering in, high probability of disappointment. We're not brokering as much in the other because we get to the point where we're so, we got to get this deal done. We got to make this work that we start losing asking that second question. What do they want? But what happens if they don't get it? The vendor should have a right to be able to make an informed decision on whether they want to accept or not accept that. And the lawyer at the end of the day, like all we want is the same thing you want. But if we don't know that we've talked to the client for all of 25 minutes, usually at that point. So it's difficult for us to understand that personality unless we've dealt with them before. Once I got their personality down though, I can take it from there, right? Because how I deal and how I talk to that client if you could be a fly on the wall in my office. And look, I encourage you guys to come in and sit through a signing with your clients anytime. You should kind of hear what they hear and not know what they know and listen to the concerns that they have. That's the best education I can actually offer you. Uh, same thing as I would suggest that you go in and sit with them when they go meet with their mortgage broker every once in a while, randomly. Oh, you're I haven't dealt with her in a while. I'd like to sit in on that. Just as, you know, coming with you. Just kind of hear what goes on. What do they ask for? You know, what do they want? You know, what are they promising? Um, and again, I'm, I don't want to waste anybody's time in adding more to your list of things to do. I just think that if I was a realtor, I would try to find a way, and I'd try to be really good at it. I'd probably suck. Austin wouldn't hire me. <laughs>
Any, any other questions about that? Okay, well with that, I'm probably going to conclude it unless anybody has some general questions. Just remember that clauses are easy. The key to remember is if your five-year-old can understand it, then you've done a good job. We laugh, but the greatest professor of all time taught me that. No matter whether you're talking in front of the Supreme Court of Canada, in front of your future wife, in front of your future girlfriend, ex-wife, future girl, uh, anyway, whoever you're talking to, if you can understand who that person is and what they want, you're better going to be able to communicate with them and actually get what you both want, a meeting of the minds. If we both know what we're going to expect, that disappointment, it then isn't real. And then you know whether or not you should defend it. I must warn you guys, I don't always defend your clients, my clients. I don't. I kind of put it into perspective for them and see where it lands. If a person is reasonable, there is no limits to where I will go. If a person is unreasonable, and I have to recognize that it's subjective for what I consider to be reasonable and unreasonable, I just think that given my experience, I have a pretty good handle on what's reasonable and unreasonable, I, I will take a different approach. Because I'm ultimately, I will not beat up on a seller because there is something in the contract that allows me to do so, unless I believe that it, it is contractually and, you know, hopefully morally right. Thank you very much.